Okay, I think we should get started. Um, so again, good evening or good afternoon or good morning uh, to you all wherever you are uh, in the world. And welcome to this webinar organized by Tel Aviv University in celebration of Women's History Month. Um, as I think uh, everybody here knows, competition for Zoom events these days is very, very fierce. So I'm happy that you were able to join and that you've chosen to be with us uh, today. Uh, the month of uh, March uh, has been dedicated in several countries around the world to women's stories, to women's lives, to women's voices. Uh, and I think that this month invites us to think about several things. Uh, one of them, for example, is the many challenges and constraints and even dangers that women in our own communities and women around the world uh, still face despite uh, two centuries of uh, the women's uh, rights movements. Uh, this past year has given us a very grim reminder of that. Uh, the, the, the challenges that remain for many women around the world have become very, very clear with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that brought to the surface problems which some of us, some of us uh, I think, may have fantasized were disappearing from the world, uh, including unequal distribution of uh, household duties, of childcare duties, uh, including women's vulnerabilities in, in the job market, uh, including domestic violence. But at the same time, the pandemic also brought to the world's attention the, the success of some extraordinary women leaders. Uh, in Germany, in Finland, in, in New Zealand, in Taiwan, and in other places in the world. And I think that this is another important function of Women's History Month, not just to reflect on the long road that's still ahead of us, uh, us women, but also to celebrate uh, extraordinary women uh, whose groundbreaking achievements are an inspiration uh, to all of us. So we're very blessed to have three such extraordinary women uh, with us uh, today. Each of these women, as you will see, uh, has, has had been remarkably successful in a field that is largely still a male reserve. Uh, and I think that each of them really is a model for the next generation of, of young women. But before I introduce uh, the panelists to you, I want to mention another extraordinary woman uh, who cannot be with us today. Dr. Shimrit Perkel Finkel uh, was a Tel Aviv University alumna in the life sciences. She was the co-founder and the CEO of uh, EcoConcrete Technologies, a company that's devoted to reducing the ecological footprints of uh, coastal and marine uh, infrastructure projects. And she was a model for many women entrepreneurs, uh, both in Israel and in other places in the world. Dr. Perkel Finkel was tragically killed in a road accident uh, earlier this month. And we'd like to dedicate our discussion today uh, to her memory. So let me introduce our panelists to you, um, and I'll introduce all three. Uh, first of all, we're lucky to have with us Dikla Barkai, who for over 15 years now has been a leading producer of TV drama, of film here in Israel. She's currently the head of scripted drama at Abot Meiri, which is one of Israel's leading production companies. Ms. Barkai is the producer and the story editor of the really wonderful TV series Shtisto, uh, that has earned, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, recognition and success both in Israel and internationally. Uh, Shtisel has been airing uh, on Netflix and won numerous awards. I was just saying to Dikla that Haaretz just published that Shtisel is nominated for Best Drama by the Israeli Academy. Uh, but Ms. Barkai also produced and co-created other successful series, including The Conductor and Srugim, as well as several feature films and documentaries that earned recognition at such film festivals as Doka Viv and Sundance. So it's really a pleasure to have you with us uh, today, Dikla. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Our second speaker will be in Valorpaz, uh, who is a startup uh, ecosystem expert, a strategic consultant in the field of innovation, and a prolific uh, public speaker. Ms. Opaz founded the Hashtag Woman in Tech initiative designed to promote women in high tech. But that's just one aspect of her career. Uh, she's also a researcher at the Institute for National Security Studies, uh, INSS. She was a high tech correspondent for the, mark, uh, the Marker uh, uh, newspaper. And she has her own uh, tech blog, which is very interesting. I encourage you all to check it out. 
And Mr. Faza was elected to the Forbes under 30 list for 2017 and to the list of 100 most influential people in Israeli high tech of geek time in 2015. And she's also a Tel Aviv University alumna. She holds an MBA as well as degrees in, in film studies and in economics uh, from Tel Aviv. Uh, so welcome, uh, Inval. Thanks for joining. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and last but certainly not least, I'm delighted to introduce to you my colleague uh, Tova Milo, who is Professor of Compu Computer Science and Dean of the Faculty of Exact Sciences here at Tel Aviv University. Professor Milo joined Tel Aviv University in 1995 after working as researcher in Paris, in Toronto, some other wonderful places. Uh, her research focuses on large-scale data management applications, such as data integration, semi-structured information, data-centered business processes, and crowdsourcing. And she holds the Tel Aviv University Chair for Information Management. Professor Milo has received grants and honors. Uh, you know, there's so many of them, I wouldn't even presume to begin to tell you about all of them, but I will mention the 2017 VLDB Women in Database Research Award, as well as the prestigious uh, grant that she received, the EU ERC Advanced Investigators uh, Grant. Uh, so hello, Tova, and thank you for joining. Thanks for inviting me. So three interesting women, uh, many interesting things to talk about. Uh, and as we turn to the conversation uh, with each of them, uh, I'd like to encourage all of you who are listening in to please uh, feel free to enter your own questions use, using the Q&A uh, function uh, on your screen. And uh, I promise that we will leave time uh, near the end for, for your questions. So uh, let's begin. Uh, Dikla, maybe we could begin with, uh, with you. Um, you're a successful producer working primarily in television. And I was thinking that we, you know, we've been hearing a lot over recent years about the difficulties of women uh, creators and, and women um, actors in the world of film. You know, we've all been exposed to the scandals around the Oscars, uh, over the lack of recognition for talented uh, women uh, in the industry. And I'm wondering about the world of television. Uh, do women experience um, similar difficulties in, in television as they do in, in the world of uh, film? Are there more opportunities for women in television? Um, I think maybe <clears throat> the world of television is a little bit more business world than the film world. Um, but eventually, uh, mostly in Israel, it's it's such a small industry in Israel, so it's the same world, it's the same people in the, in the film industry and in the television industry. <clears throat> but um, so I, I can speak in general about both worlds. I guess in, in outside of Israel, it's a little, little bit different, but I will speak about my, my adventure. Um, but sorry, not adventure, but uh, experience. I think that I'm very lucky to live and work in our days when women have all the possibilities open for them. I also watched and felt the significant process that the status of women in the world gone through. And I embrace the change. I embrace the speed with which changes take, they take place. Um, but still there's more way to go. Um, I think that being a woman in a position like mine in a day is, is eventually a daily struggle. You have to fight for some of the things you want to achieve or, 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 to, or to say much more than a man does. I love what I do. I wouldn't change it for the world. Yet, I think that being a woman in this position is more challenging. <laughs> Can, can you tell us a little bit about what some of the challenges are? Um, most, of, most of the decision makers are, the me are men. And I, I love the men around me. I, I love the creators, the directors, the writers. I feel very lucky to know them and to work with them. But it's, it's still a man's world. And, um, and I think that um, it's not. It's not only me, and I don't think that there is somebody who 
who are against me or that uh, treat me badly in, in the day, daily life. But it's bigger than that. It's, it's, we are all a part of it as a society. And we grew up uh, with this set of values about women and we just took it, even me on myself. And um, when I'm, I think it's, it's only now when I'm more mature that I, 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 I am willing to admit it, that I, I found difficult, difficulties during my day, during some um, negotiations or um, just when I want to reach a project or uh, to make a change, then I find myself struggle harder than men around me. So Is I there something that, that you would say to um, a, a young woman who's just out of film school and is ready to embark on a career in this industry. Is there any advice from your position of working now for, you know, for quite a long time uh, that you would give that we give a, a young woman like that? Um, it's a hard, hard question. <laughs> um, eventually, I would say just to keep her individuality. And uh, this is the strongest thing. Um, it's true that we are a part of a society and we, and we are play a role in, in, in this big game, but eventually we are individual and we have to go after our own willing and our own uh, way. So just to keep up to ourselves. Yeah, that, that, that's good advice. <laughs> uh, let me let me turn to uh, to ask you about uh, this internationally successful series that you've been producing, uh, Stiesel. Um, you know, it's it, it also reflects a certain interest in in men's stories in this in, in this industry, right? It's a story primarily about a father and a son uh, in the ultra orthodox uh, world. But one of the things that I found uh, fascinating about Stiesel is there are several very interesting female characters uh, who are genuinely complex, uh, very different from the stereotypical depiction of Orthodox women. How do you see the women in these series? And you, as a, I think, as a secular uh, Jewish uh, Israeli uh, woman, do you feel that you understand them or identify with their lives? Yes, very much. Um... What I find, find unique about Shtisil, it's that uh, Shtisil, it's not really a, a series about the Haredi world. Eventually it's about humanity and, um, and, and women inside the, the society are also in a way like us. Of course, it's different to be, to, different to be a part of this strict society, but um, but if you look very deep down inside the character, then you find that they have, um, in a way, uh, 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 their own struggle that we can identify with. And when we think about the, the woman in the Orthodox society, we immediately think of the cliche. And um, I think a lot of series or books that deal deals with, the, um, with this society, with, with tell a story about women that wants to go out of the society, that wants to be individual and be and, and go out of the society. And Shtisil deals with women inside the society. They don't want to go out. They want to keep their families and they want to keep their places inside. They don't have this kind of conflict, but still they are very strong, even though they're the society rules, uh, there's no equal rights, of course, in this society, but then um, if you, if you um, watch the series, then you understand that the women in Shtisel would be very, very strong. I think in Shtisel we make a huge effort to bring the truth, to show the world as it is without judgment. We don't want to be critical nor flattering. Also, we want to avoid the cliché. So when we talk about women in, in the Haredi society, 
course, there are no equal rights, as I said, but there are always more options in, in, in reality, in the story. Life is not black and white, even not inside the mass sharing. So um, what, what the series taught me is that within any, within any society, with its rules and, and codes of behavior, there is still room for the individual. And, and when we look at, the, at one individual, they have their own choices and action within the society. Is there a particular uh, female character that uh, you feel the most connected to or you think is the most interesting? Um, it's hard to choose, but uh, I, I will choose Gitti. Uh, I, I hope you know her, the character. Um, she, really, she really wants to keep her place in the family, she wants to be the wife and she wants to be uh, the daughter and the mother. She, she has no big dreams. She doesn't have no really dreams to be a big woman or to do a, a great things in the world. All her uh, dreams are just to be inside the family and to stay in our eyes, maybe a small woman. But um, in the first season, her husband left leaves her and she really fight a very big fight just to, to to stay in her own place to keep her family together to keep everything as they all know uh, as it is and uh, it's very impressive that the fight and the actions that she does against the world and uh, against the men in her family her husband their father and um, and when you see it you you can learn the you can learn a lot from her. <laughs> Surely identify with her. <laughs> yeah, she's certainly a very a very strong character, one of the strongest characters in the series. Um, there's something strange about Stiesel's success, maybe, uh, because it is about such a a, a niche, you know, such a small community. Uh, it it speaks in Hebrew and in Yiddish, and yet it has uh, enjoyed such great international success. And I'm wondering, uh, Declad, why do you think Shtisel is so successful? Why does it speak to so many people uh, internationally? Um, it was also a surprise for us. We didn't, we didn't mean, <laughs> we, we, we did a we small didn't mean series. to be successful. <laughs> we, not internationally. We didn't know then uh, that, that it was a surprise for us as well. And we were very happy, of course, and proud. Um, I think Stiesel is, is a very specific story about specific uh, family, specific neighborhood in Masharim, and very small, and speak Hebrew, as you said, and Yiddish. But uh, I learned that the more local you are and, and faithful for the truth, then it, you, the more universal you are. And eventually, Stiesel... Um, deals with the conflicts we all deal with. It's about love and, and par parenting and, and um, fear and um, loneliness. Uh, it's all topics and, and themes that we all can identify with. And um, Stiesel really touches these places um, in, in a very deep way, without the judgment, and we try without trying to say anything about about the re the religious people or the the, the community, and um, maybe maybe that's the reason we see less and less series like this in tel in television around us uh, around us these days. So um, we're lucky to to be successful with this kind of series that has a slow story without any violence, sex. It's not even glamorous, but still probably touches the heart. <laughs> yeah, I think that uh, you, you really put it in, in you know, a very lovely sentence that the, somehow the more local you are, the more universal you become. Uh, that's very interesting. Let me ask you just one last question. I'm just curious. Uh, um, what are you working on now? Is there a new project that we, we can uh, know about? 
I'm working on a new series about the Netanyahu, Netanyahu's uh, biography and oh. the Netanyahu's family. Yes, oh. and it's really very interesting, more than I thought. <laughs> um, wow. Yes, and okay. um, what else? There is another Israeli series about the um, uh, Mizrahi, you know, a uh, singer. It's uh, like um, it's like a hip hop. It's the neighborhood uh, music, so it's um, it's very fun and and family series. Sounds <laughs> like fun. <laughs> Thank you, Dikla. Um, let me turn uh, to you, Inval, uh, if I may. Um, sure. So we're moving to a completely different world from the class world, uh, a world that is maybe even more male dominated than the world of film and television. And that is the world of uh, high tech and entrepreneurship. Um, I was thinking that, you know, when, when the dominant narrative of Israel changed from being very much uh, focused on military achievements and, uh, you know, kind of as a, as a condition for leadership, right? You had to go through the army and be successful in it. It moved to this new narrative of Israel as the startup nation. And one would have expected that this shift uh, would be more welcoming to women somehow, right? That the, you know, the army has been limited in its opportunities for women uh, for many years, but maybe this new high tech culture will be open uh, to admit women on a more equal uh, basis. But I think the situation is more complicated, right? I know that you wrote in, a, in your blog uh, a little while ago about a, a survey that was done on women in, in high tech in Israel. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Of course. And just reminded me that, you know, a fun fact that many of us uh, are not aware of, uh, that originally programming was a profession of women. Uh, there's a nice uh, article that you can Google from the Cosmopolitan from 1967. And you see programmers, women programmers uh, working on uh, IBM uh, machines. But the history has changed. And uh, if we can connect it uh, to the things that Bikla uh, has just said, and when we're looking at our role models and in the media, like who is a hacker? Who is, you know, the people are, uh, we see them working with computers and, you know, becoming entrepreneurs. We don't see female figures as role models. And this has uh, an effect on us as a society. So before I get uh, to your question, uh, when I see from my personal uh, angle, so back in at high school, I did study computer science and I was actually quite good at it, but I didn't like coding. And I said, okay, that's boring. I don't want to do it or, all my life. And then uh, when it was time for me to go uh, to the university, I said, okay, economics, this is nice. I was also good at it. And then I looked at the syllabus of uh, the film studies and I said, that's great. Uh, so also I uh, had my degree uh, in this. Uh, and then when I graduated or even actually before, uh, I, I started to work as a journalist, uh, as I said at the marker. And for those of you who don't know, I would say that the marker is like the Israeli version of uh, Wall Street Journal, it's a financial newspaper covering uh, what's happening in the uh, financial aspects of uh, Israel. Uh, and I got the opportunity to cover the Israeli tech industry. Uh, and I was also quite young. I was in uh, my uh, mid, even before my mid uh, 20s. And I always had this experience of coming to a place for interviewing. It could be uh, executives or founders or investors and all of them or almost all of them were men. And over and over again, I had this uh, experience of being the only woman in the room. Uh, and from my own experience and you know, looking at what is going on, uh, exploring this problem or the situation of uh, women in tech was something that I was very interested in to understand the aspect of this problem. What is the situation to understand what are the numbers and, you know, where do we lose the women uh, in the way uh, uh, to the tech uh, industry? Uh, and as I left the marker, I, I still didn't know, like, how will I uh, deal or how it will be involved in the this topic, uh, and then it was two years ago, and exactly at uh, March 2019, I opened my calendar and I was invited as a speaker to many events uh, related to women, as a moderator or as a panelist or to give a talk. And I said, 
I want to give something else because usually uh, there's this, you know, top, top executive or a CEO and he arrives and he says, we really want to recruit or to hire women, but they just don't apply. We don't get their CVs. And I said, okay, that's true. I do believe them. They don't get uh, the CVs, but there's got to be a better answer. And there are some things that could be done. Uh, so I was thinking, okay, what can I do? I want to hear what the women who work in the tech industry has to say about it. So I opened uh, you know, a Google form and just decided uh, to make a survey. Uh, and I was talking with a friend uh, that back at the time was a PhD student uh, in Tel Aviv University. Uh, they asked him, you know, to, to, to have, you know, a big uh, sample to get accurate uh, uh, information. How many responses do I need? I said, okay, if you get to 100, you're going to be okay. And then very soon, after a few days, uh, we had more than 1,000 uh, women uh, who participated in the survey. And very soon, employers realized that it's an interesting asset for them to understand what bothers women in tech and what can they do and what, you know, li like the field said, what do uh, women uh, think? And this is how I started uh, women, uh, in, women in Tech Theory. Uh, and uh, the survey that uh, you just uh, saw, it was the second time that uh, I did it this time. I did it uh, with the partners with the Scale of Velocity. That is, that is a part of the Startup Nation Central, which is an NGO that is focused uh, in the Israeli tech industry. It was founded by the people who wrote the book, The Startup Nation. And this time I was more focused on understanding what are the needs and what are the things that we should put on the table to understand this problem and to solve it. Because we, we don't want to talk only about the problems. We also want to solve them or at least to try. So, so let's start with the problems. What, what are the problems? What did you find out? Why are women um, underrepresented in tech? Okay, so this first thing, that, which is quite obvious, uh, is that uh, women, they don't go in this direction. And they don't go maybe because they're not uh, directed or educated uh, to go there. Uh, but when we look at the numbers, uh, just last week, uh, there was a new report that was published that showed that uh, high school students, uh, women uh, uh, students, they do their bagrut, which is their final exams uh, in the university. If they do uh, the exams in math or science, uh, then 30% of them, they will go and study uh, STEM studies when they get to university. Uh, and it was six times higher than uh, students uh, who didn't uh, study math and science. So it is important to start as early as possible, uh, you know, to get a sense. Maybe, you know, like me, they won't go this direction, but to give them the opportunity. And for men, th that were not the numbers. Men, even those who didn't study it uh, uh, in high school, they still went in this direction. And, you know, you, I guess that uh, Tova will talk about, you know, things that uh, she sees uh, in faculties. But the first thing is that in order to become uh, someone who works in the tech industry, you need the right training and you have to go this direction. So this is one thing and definitely this is a change. It is, you know, it's a long-term change. Uh, so I'm trying to focus on the things that uh, the companies, the organizations can change because I think that uh, we're in the point of time that in order to make, you know, the next step uh, in changing this situation, we need the companies and we need the men. And the next uh, problems that uh, women uh, brought up uh, in the survey, so the, the first one uh, was the challenge or the struggle to have both career and family at the same time. Because it might be uh, not uh, feminist to say, because uh, everyone is talking about, you know, when you read, for example, Sheryl Zandberg of uh, Facebook, she says like, you can have both family and career at the same time. And many women, they have this guilt feeling that they cannot do uh, everything. And uh, in your opening, uh, you mentioned, you know, the, the COVID-19 or the Corona and, we're talking about, you know, uh, damage of uh, tens of years uh, for women in the workforce. 
And the reason that is happening is that women still do most of the unpaid job. They still uh, handle uh, most of the, the caring in the children and the house. And the, uh, once we had the corona and children were at home, this challenge became even greater. Uh, there is a survey that was uh, done by uh, Lean In, it's the organization that uh, was founded by Sheryl Sandberg and McKinsey, and it was uh, published uh, in September. And they said that uh, women uh, that have uh, children under the age of uh, 10, so 23% of them, they consider leaving the workforce due to the corona. Uh, so this struggle, you know, we have to talk about it. And uh, uh, one of the ways, you know, to solve it or to improve it. So first of all, there's a lot of uh, flexible things that we can do, you know, in the workforce. For example, working from home could be a solution. Not all, you know, not totally work from home, but making this hybrid solution of working both from home and the office could be very helpful for women. And we saw it in the survey when we asked women, uh, when you consider uh, uh, where to work, what is important for you in the employer? And uh, almost 40% of the mothers, they said, and it was before it was, we did a survey one week before the first lockdown. They said, working from home is important for me. And this is even before most of the organizations knew that it was even possible or, you know, enabled their uh, employees to do it. So that was the second reason, this uh, tension between uh, the family and the career. And the third thing uh, is the, the lack of role models. Uh, and it, 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 there are many ways to look at it. Uh, for example, women, again, if I'm looking at uh, the employer side, uh, we ask uh, women, what bothers you uh, when uh, you're interviewing for a company? and you don't want to work there, or what, what is wrong in the process? And many of the women, they said that if they don't see a woman as part of the recruiting process, you know, it could be in uh, someone that interviews them, or to, when they come to the office and they don't see women there, they feel that they have a ceiling glass, and they feel that this work environment is not good for them, and that they won't have opportunities in this uh, organization. Uh, and there is a problem, like we usually when we're talking about uh, the um, situation of uh, women, we're talking about leadership position or, you know, the executives or CEOs. But the problem is that it starts much earlier. There's a problem that's called the, the broken rung. It's like a ladder that you have, you know, to climb. But the first uh, level is broken or the first rung is broken. For every, uh, for every 100 uh, men employees who are recruited to uh, uh, US companies, and this is again uh, McKinsey and Lean In uh, data, uh, there are 92 women who are being recruited, you know, for entry level positions, which is not, you know, totally equal, but I think it's okay. It's almost there. But then when you're looking at the, the manager position, which is, you know, the first opportunity to become managers, then you have a, a, a gap of like 30%. For every 100 men who are being promoted to being a manager, you have only 72 uh, women there. And then the higher you climb, you see less and less women because at, at the first, you know, opportunity, they were not say, hired or promoted. And then they had family and they had to care, take care of the children and all those problems. So when you combine it all together, you get to, to this problem. So let me ask you the, a question from, uh, from a different direction. So, you know, uh, you spoke uh, very um, interestingly about the challenges that women have to face in entering this world. But what about uh, the world of high tech itself? What does it stand to gain from having uh, more women represented at any of these, uh, you know, stages in the ladder that you described. Is there, can we talk about a different um, work style, a different style of entrepreneurship that women bring uh, to, to Startup Nation? Uh, is, does it even make sense to differentiate on the basis of gender, um, the styles of, of work and uh, initiative? So first of all, I think all kind of diversity, you know, is welcome and is good and we want to see different perspectives. So it could be men and women, but 
talking about the Israeli society. So we have other minority groups here. Uh, we have uh, ultra orthodox, for example, and there is uh, maybe we should do something you know about uh, the ultra orthodox in uh, uh, the tech industry and the, the people uh, from Shtisel because there are very interesting things uh, happening in the ultra orthodox uh, the tech uh, uh, scene or ecosystem. Uh, so I think, first of all, we, we as a society, we need more uh, diversity. Then there's the financial or the economical point of view. People working, and I, I wouldn't even talk you know, only about entrepreneurship, people working in the tech industry, their average salary is more than two times the average salary in Israel. So, and we all know that the cost of living in Israel is crazy high. Uh, so people that want to improve their life, they want to be part of this, uh, you know, this circle or, or this, you know, uh, small group of people. It's only 10% uh, of uh, the employees in Israel. They work in the tech uh, industry and they pay the higher taxes. 25% uh, of the income tax uh, in Israel is paid by the people working in the tech industry. And we said it is only 10% uh, of uh, you know the uh, the workforce, so it's also good for the economy, and especially now that the expenditure is so high. Uh, but then when we talk, looking you know at uh, uh, executive teams uh, of women, so for example, one interesting uh, study finds that uh, uh, startups that has at least one uh, female founders, they hire more than two times more female or women uh, employees. And, and it makes a lot of sense because we know that first of all, uh, most of the hiring in the tech industry is done, you know, by uh, referral. What we call uh, in Hebrew, it's 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 nice. Like a friend brings a friend. So we bring the people that we know. We we know both men and women. Problem, by the way, uh, with this uh, referral recruiting is not the gender diversity, but other kinds of uh, diversity. Uh, but also, as we said. Women, when they in being interviewed for a company, they want to see other women there. They don't want to feel again, you know, the the only women, woman in the room. Uh, and the, in uh, our survey, ninety percent of uh, the women they reported that at least once in a, a work context they felt or they were uh, the only woman in the room. And one third of them said that they don't like this feeling of being a minority. Uh, so I think, you know, the more women uh, that will be there, it will also attract more uh, women uh, to go there. Uh, and there are also like an, another uh, um, research that was published, I think like two or three weeks ago. Uh, it was not about startups, but I think it's interesting to, to understand the meaning of it. Uh, they research um, hedge funds. And they found that investors in hedge funds, they target mostly companies with uh, women CEOs. And the reason why they do it is because uh, when uh, hedge fund investors, when they target a company, they want you know, to acquire the company and to improve the value of the company. Uh, and they found that working with women and cooperating with them, uh, it just, you know, they bring better uh, performance. And the reason that they do it is because it's easier to communicate with them. They have better communication skills. That's uh, very so this, interesting. Now that yeah. actually answers the question of the different styles of, uh, <laughs> uh, in the workplace. That's, that's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Inbal. I have a feeling that as we move to Professor Tova Milo, a lot of these issues are going to resurface because the worlds that you inhabit are, are not that uh, different. Um, but Tova and I, uh, we also share uh, the experience of being a woman in the academic world. And the university is a very complex uh, world in terms of uh, gender. You know, there are many, many aspects to discussing gender uh, at the university. Uh, some of them we've already uh, uh, mentioned in other contexts, the idea that there are certain obstacles that women face in their academic careers, uh, 
in, in the case of uh, university life, it often involves not being able to go on a postdoc, for example, because of family obligations or because your spouse can't leave. Uh, and so Tel Aviv University uh, tries to do things like uh, provide scholarships for women uh, specifically to go on postdocs. There's the question of women in leadership positions at the university. Um, which has traditionally been uh, um, very limited. And I think here too, we can, you know, we can report some uh, progress, uh, at least at Tel Aviv University, where in the past year, I think 10 out of the 14 uh, leadership appointments uh, at the university were of women, including Tova Bilo, who I think is the first woman uh, dean of the exact sciences, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, of course, you are, you are, uh, your interface uh, with this, with the issue of gender at the university, has to do with uh, you know the the main issue of women in STEM, uh, and uh, the 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 lack of equal representation, the tra the history of the lack of uh, equal representation of uh, girls and women in in STEM uh, subjects. So, could you, could I just ask you to give us a, a little bit of a brief? sketch of the current situation at Tel Aviv University? Are women closing the gaps in, in fields such as the exact sciences and uh, in technology? Um, so women are still a minority as they've been for many years. But yes, uh, I think the situation in some sense uh, uh, is getting better. Um, I think there is a lot of work being done uh, in, over the last several years in high schools, uh, trying to uh, push uh, girls, uh, young women, uh, more and more towards uh, uh, exact sciences, uh, studying math, physics, chemistry, and so on. And we see the effect. Um, actually, in the Faculty of Exact Sciences in Tel Aviv, uh, if you look at the enrollment, uh, how many women are entering uh, uh, first degree compared to how many men, uh, we're doing pretty well. Uh, uh, we're increasing. And I think today we're something like uh, around 35 degree, 35% uh, 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 of the students uh, in undergrad uh, studies are women. Uh, in computer science this year, actually, we, were, we went high to 40%. Uh, uh, in chemistry, we're 60%. Uh, so it's really great. Uh, the problem is this is uh, the case for undergrad uh, studies. Once you go up to a master's degree, uh, you drop down to around 15%. Uh, when you go a little bit higher to a PhD, it goes down to 10%. And the faculty uh, is around that number. So uh, why, why is that? Do you have an explanation for why the, the number of women seep out uh, the further they go in their academic career in STEM? So the great thing about being in the university is that every question that you have or that you may want to, uh, to know the answer to, uh, uh, there is a researcher in the university that has done a research on that and can give you the answer. So when I just started my, uh, uh, my deanship, uh, this was one of the things that really bothered me and, and I really had to find out uh, what's going on. And, and I went and discussed with colleagues whose research area is exactly that. And it turns out that uh, what happens, uh, there are actually two things. Uh, uh, one thing is that uh, something which is called cold climate. Uh, women feel uh, that they don't belong. Uh, uh, they get remarks uh, from friends, from professors, from uh, 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 people that make them feel that this is not the right place for them, that they're not as good as others, uh, that uh, they're not the best in class, uh, and so on. And this discourages them uh, uh, from uh, uh, pursuing higher degrees. And the second thing is uh, what Inbal mentioned uh, earlier, uh, they finish their, they graduate uh, their undergrad uh, degree. By then they're uh, older, I think a little bit than in other countries in the world because typically they went uh, uh, for army uh, service before. So they already have uh, often a family, they have children uh, or about to have them. And while men manage to juggle uh, between uh, working uh, and then studying part-time and then switching to, uh, 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 to higher degrees, me women find this more difficult. And mostly they don't think they can do it. 
that it's really a question of confidence. Can I manage all these things? Uh, uh, men say, yes, I can. And women say, uh, probably not. And the thing they give up on uh, often is uh, higher, higher degree studies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there so, a basis in fact to women's uh, feeling in STEM that they are perhaps not doing as well, they're not being integrated as well into these subjects? Uh, no, uh, so actually that's another thing I just checked, you know, I, I, I asked the same question and then, uh, you know, there all the, all the data is there. I went ahead and checked. I checked for computer science, for instance. They graduate, uh, uh, if you look at the average of the students that graduate uh, uh, first degree, uh, the average for female students is about the same as uh, uh, as for male students. Uh, there's maybe w here and there, there's sometimes one point difference, but, you know, one point is not a lot. And it's uh, really a statistical error. Uh, so it's, it, uh, they're doing well. Uh, just that in their heads, they're not doing, I mean, they don't trust themselves for being as good as they are. That's, that's uh, fascinating. So it's a purely subjective feeling of, uh, of not yeah, belonging. So, so now here you are, the, the first woman dean of uh, exact sciences. Um, what do you do? How do, how you, how do you deal <laughs> with that? So there is no easy answer uh, to that, obviously. Uh, but we're trying. Uh, so one project that uh, we've just started a uh, uh, couple of months ago uh, uh, is a big uh, a mentorship uh, program throughout the whole uh, faculty where the Faculty of Exact Sciences com is composed of five schools. It's mathematics, computer science, physics, chemistry, and environmental studies. And uh, uh, what we're doing is uh, uh, um, we are starting a mentorship pro uh, program in uh, giving forward fashion, which means that the female faculty are mentoring the PhD students that are themselves mentoring the master students that are themselves mentoring uh, undergrad the students uh, third year that are themselves mentoring first year and second year students. And the, the idea is not just to mentor, it's not just giving advice or, or teaching the students uh, 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 what to do, but actually the mentorship uh, uh, um, will be performed by having two mentors, me mentoring five uh, 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 mentees, which means that it will form a small group of support. So, uh, uh, and then by mixing and meeting uh, groups one with the, with the other, we're hoping to provide uh, a network of support uh, for the students so that every student will be able to have a friend at the same level, someone below, someone higher, uh, so that they consult with uh, uh, a bit like, uh, you know, I'm always thinking about uh, the Harvard um, uh, network or the MIT network of men. Uh, so we want to have something similar here, uh, a real network of support uh, uh, for women. And, and we're working on it. We started, uh, we're in the first steps of that. And I hope, you know, you never know whether this will make the difference, but I hope it will at least make some difference uh, towards the right direction. It'll be very interesting to see if, uh, if that model is successful uh, at the university, whether it can then spread to the world that Inbal was talking about, you know, where women feel alone in the room, uh, maybe can be duplicated in the, in the industry as well and, and provide a solution also to some of the problems that we discussed before. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to ask you, Tova, uh, if you don't mind my asking, uh, would, you, would you tell us a little bit about your own story? Uh, how, how did you end up in... Uh, <laughs> How did you end up choosing your career? Oh, that's a terrible story. Non-feminist completely. Uh, uh, it starts, okay. <laughs> it starts when I was, I think, 14. Uh, I was a very smart student in high school, straight A's, uh, everything. Uh, uh, and then in Israel, when you're 14 or 15, something like that, you have to choose uh, what to major in, uh, uh, what, what subject uh, you plan to, uh, uh, to study. And all my friends, my girlfriends, uh, wanted to go and uh, uh, study, uh, I think it was literature and linguistics. And, you know, uh, I had straight A's in that too. And I said, okay, I'll go with them. But I had a boyfriend then, which was two years uh, older than me. And I went to him and I told him, hey, I'm going to go to study literature and linguistics. And he looked at me and he said, what? Are you stupid? You're so smart. You have to go and study mathematics and physics. Come on. Uh, it's a total waste if you don't do that. 
I was then more obedient than I'm today. And I said, okay. And I went to study uh, uh, mathematics and physics. And then at the end of high school, uh, still same boyfriend, uh, uh, he was two years older than me. He was something uh, which we call in Hebrew Atuda. It's a program where you go to, uh, to study before going to the army. He was a student at the Technion. And all I wanted to do is to be with my boyfriend. I, you know, I didn't care what, but I wanted to be in the Technion with him. So I said, okay, I'll do the same program also. I had no clue what to uh, 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 go and study. So I told him, okay, uh, can you enroll me to something? And he enrolled me. And uh, first degree in computer science, second degree in computer science, PhD in computer science. And uh, since then I switched boyfriend. Uh, uh, I had a very supportive uh, husband as well, uh, who pushed me forward uh, also and went with me for my postdoc abroad, uh, went with me back to Israel when I finished my postdoc. Uh, I have two very supportive uh, children, uh, two boys uh, that are very proud of their mother and uh, don't mind that she works hard uh, uh, or mind, but don't tell her that they mind. Um, so I, I, I think the secret in my case was really super supportive uh, environment. And if I talk to my colleagues that, uh, you know, that are like me, uh, so typically uh, they are very strong women uh, with very supportive background. And what I think is that this is in a sense not fair because not all women have very supportive surrounding and not all women are very strong and it's okay not to be strong. Uh, if you look around, the men around me, uh, you know, they're less strong, uh, they can be mediocre. So I think it's okay. Uh, I, I think we will have equality when we will have mediocre women in high positions, uh, just like men. And, and until then, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. That, that's a good, actually a great story. You're right. It's not a, it's not a feminist manifesto, what you just told us. No. But first of all, it, you know, it included the very important uh, lesson, and that is you have, to, uh, you have to create a support system for yourself if you're going to yeah. make it in this world, uh, even if you're mediocre. And of course, the second lesson is that the world of literature, to which I belong, has lost a great, uh, a great uh, <laughs> researcher. So I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, we do have just a little bit more time, and I, uh, I want to raise a question that was uh, put in the Q&A um, uh, in the chat, and that is whether, you know, any of you or all of you can uh, speculate a little bit about uh, uh, the corona, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and what effect, if any, do you think it will have on your field? Um, generally or in terms of the presence of women uh, or the success of women? Anyone who wants to jump in? So I can say that uh, in academia, uh, if you look at faculty, for instance, young faculty uh, uh, that, have, that has just started and need to build a name for themselves and uh, need to advance uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so again, it goes back to what supportive system you have because uh, for the last year, the kids were at home. So uh, juggling between uh, doing research, uh, running your, uh, 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 yeah, running your uh, uh, classes and, and, and you know, taking care of your kids uh, has been a nightmare. And many of them uh, did, less than their male colleagues. So, uh, uh, so I think uh, for, especially for young faculty, this has been a disastrous uh, a year and we will have to take consideration of that uh, in the next years when consider their promotion, their advancement uh, and, so, and so on, uh, because it's not fair to compare them uh, uh, to, male, to male at the same, at the same state because you know, if they wrote, if they published a few, few, fewer papers, it's not because they're stupid. It's because it's very hard uh, to publish a paper when you have to uh, feed your children, play with them, uh, and so on. If you have a wonderful husband uh, or spouse or, or support system, 
uh, you can do it uh, if your support system is so so uh, terrible. So so we will have to take care of them and help them. Yeah, yeah. Declare or invite? Do you do you have something you want to say about that? Um, I think uh, television will be uh, stronger, maybe. Uh, because uh, people will stay at home, but um, life is going to be back and um, don't, I don't think that um, we will see much of change in my field in women's uh, environment. It, it was hard before, it will be hard again. And maybe, maybe these this possibilities of working from home could be a little bit uh, helpful for them, uh, these choices that we have to make part of the meetings, part of the, um, not to run to any, any small thing to the office. Uh, it's a new world, so in that matter. Um, so we'll see how hybrid will it be and uh, if we will not forget it all and, and, and shall we take something from it to our life? We'll see. Yeah, I, I'm also curious to see how this uh, pandemic will be represented in television and film. You know, we haven't gotten there yet, but it will be very interesting to see how this special period that we've just all gone through uh, will become material for, uh, for you guys uh, to make uh, interesting. Uh, I don't know, Finval, if you wanted to add something about that? So I already said that uh, the pandemic uh, wiped out uh, gains of 50 years uh, of women in the workplace and uh, some call it uh, a she session, like recession, but for, you know, she session. Uh, but I'm trying to think, I still don't have the answer, but trying to understand how we can make this an opportunity to make a change. Uh, and talking about fathers in the workforce, I think for many of them, even though we, we have data, they didn't do more work at home uh, than before in, in average. But I, I think it's still they had an opportunity, like I have friends and they said, wow, finally I got some time to spend, you know, with my family uh, and, you know, to meet my kids. I didn't know them uh, before like this. Uh, and there's a really nice uh, initiative uh, uh, by the, um, I don't know even how is it called, it's like the HR of uh, the public service uh, in Israel, Netzibut Shiruta Medina. If any of you know the, the English term for this uh, office, but this is like the HR of uh, the people who are working for the government. Uh, and they have an initiative uh, called the uh, Father at Four, Abba Be'arba. Uh, and they're trying to encourage fathers uh, to use their rights uh, because people working for the government as fathers, as parents in general, uh, they have uh, some rights, they can leave earlier and, and so on. But I found out that they don't use it. And some of them don't know that they can use it. Uh, and some of them feel uncomfortable. They did a survey and they found that uh, Many of them, they uh, afraid that they won't be promoted or that uh, they, their salary or they, they won't get raised or that their salary uh, would be hurt. Uh, and I think this is the solution. Like the organizations have uh, to take uh, a step and to make a change and to make the work environment uh, uh, to fit this new uh, world and the uh, Many of the organizations, not only in the tech industry, they are talking about making the hybrid work uh, environment. It will also be for people, uh, you know, living outside the big cities and for people with disabilities. So it could be uh, a big uh, opportunity. And uh, the more fathers will be involved and, you know, uh, will uh, carry this uh, burden of uh, taking care of, you know, of the house and the children, it will make space for uh, women. Like this afternoon, I was uh, uh, walking with my dog uh, and there's so many fathers at four o'clock, you know, picking their children. And for me, it was, right. I, I was very happy to see it because I think this will make the change because uh, their wives that are working at this time and they're advancing their career and this will make the difference. Here, here. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, uh, even though there were more questions in the chat, so we're not going to be able to get to them, unfortunately. But I'd like to thank the three wonderful and very busy uh, women who gave of their time uh, to us uh, today, Tova Milo, Inbal Orpaz, and Dikla Barkai. Um, a very big thank you to all the people who organized the event. Uh, first and foremost, Ayana Segal Cohen and Kara Case from the Tel Aviv University Trust in London. Uh, thank you to Sigalit Ben Chayun from uh, Tao's alumni organization and to Yonatan Tuval from the Kohler School of Management. And finally, thank you to all of you who joined us. Uh, enjoy the rest of uh, today, the rest of March, uh, Women's History Month. Uh, those of us in Israel go out and vote tomorrow, so that change, uh, uh, whatever change you're looking for or uh, desire uh, will occur. Uh, and of course, a uh, happy Passover to everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.